So where can you go to see the live streaming? I know so little about these tech things. All right, we are live. <laughs> Good to see you, Carol. Man, Hi, it's Carol. good to see you. You look great. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah. I like your hair, Carol. <laughs> huh? I like your hair. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Leslie cut her hair. Oops. Yeah. She got gushed yeah. up. Nice. Not that it doesn't usually look nice, but. <laughs> Noah, good to see you in Japan, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Well. How's the weather? It's nice. It's just, it's really nice. It's, um yeah, it's been pretty <gasps> mild. And, yeah, it's been, I've definitely been enjoying, enjoying the, the weather for sure. I just saw one of your past things on YouTube and you had a, a black and white wood block. And I said, God, that's that thing I see in my dreams all the time. I'll uh -huh. have to tell you, I'll tell you about it later. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -oh. Crazy. <laughs> um. I love that graphic. Mm -hmm. No, about how, how long is each person? Uh, well, everybody came under um, an hour, uh, the ample time. So there was something like, um, I forgot, I, kept, I had a log of it, but it came to maybe 40 five minutes so if i didn't time you or carol uh so yeah do you have enough time how long is your piece um, um an hour uh, the ample time so there was something like um i forgot i kept i had a log of it uh, oops um, i just repeated yeah i just read the same thing probably. um though yeah mine is like i think it's like five or six minutes Okay, perfect. Yeah. Everybody was about, yeah, five, six. Mm -hmm. We're good. We just want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Well, if somebody wants to watch it other than this, can they see it on YouTube right now? Or do they have to wait till after? No, it's it, we're live, so folks can folks are tuning in now. We have a uh, oh two people watching. <laughs> okay, hello. So the link is on APIC website. Um, if folks registered, the link is there, um, and I also shared it in the chat. Okay. So you can share it with folks too. Anyone last? Any last minute people? And we'll get started in about five minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Folks should also unmute mute their cell phones. I've been on enough panels where phones start ringing. I know, yeah. Mute your phones. <laughs> That's a good idea. Thank <laughs> you. 
Everybody remember to mute yourselves for now. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for the dog to bark to do it. One minute. <laughs> All right, it's five o'clock. Um, so for everyone joining us on Zoom, please mute yourselves until it's time for you to speak. Or if you're an audience member, just please be muted until the end. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Hello everyone, um, welcome. <laughs> Uh, my name is Melanie Alvena. I am the Artistic Director at Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center. Um, and you are here tonight. There, we have folks here on Zoom, as well as on YouTube for Jenny Lim's um, uh, meaning, no, sorry, memory, meaning, and memoir reading. Um, it's, it's a culmination of a workshop series that we've been doing with Jenny throughout the pandemic um, and have continued on. So we're super happy to have another, another series of readers this evening, um, a little bit of the about the Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center. Our mission is to promote and present art that is reflective of the unique experiences of Asians and Pacific Islanders living in the United States. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to um, take a moment to honor the fact that many of us, myself included, are currently situated on the ancestral and unceded territory of Yalamu, which is the land of the Ohlone Rem Remitush people. Um, we want to name and honor the stolen indigenous lands we reside on, work, and create art on, and recognize the agency of Native peoples who continue to steward the histories and futures of these places. If you'd like to do more than listen to this land acknowledgement, please consider contributing to the Shumi land tax or the Unikin land tax for anyone who lives here in San Francisco or the peninsula. Um, if you are tuning in um, from other areas, please let us know where you're coming from um, in the chat. And you can also research the indigenous communities where you are located and find other ways to contribute um, in the movement to return land back to indigenous people. 
Um, this event is part of Apex 26th Annual United States of Asian America Festival, Reimagining Horizons, um, where we're presenting up to 20 different programs reflecting the artistic accomplishments and cultural diversity of San Francisco's AAPI communities. Um, USOF showcases artists representing a diverse range of ethnic and cultural groups and aims to heighten the visibility of AAPI artists working in all disciplines, theater, music, dance, film, literature, visual arts, and many more. Our goal is to nurture and empower these groups um, to be self-sufficient while providing the support they need to grow. Um, the festival and um, would also not be possible without our funders, San Francisco Grants for the Arts, San Francisco Arts Commission, San Francisco Office of Economic and Workforce Development, California Arts Council, and of course, Zeller Block Family Foundation. Um, and I just want to give a shout out and say thank you to my APEX staff who are present. Um, I have Angelo here, who is our festival intern. So he's going to be helping out tonight. So thank you, Angelo. Um, and also just a, one last thing. If you do enjoy tonight's program, um, we encourage you to email your um, city supervisors and urge them to continue supporting and funding AAPI art and artists, as this is part of also our larger AAPI Heritage Month. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for everyone joining. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now to Jenny Lin. Thank you so much, Melanie and Angelo, TJ Vasa and Vinay, the whole APIC crew. We're really honored and proud to be part of the festival again this year. I could call us the pandemic poets because we've been, um, this is actually the fourth iteration of memory, meaning, and memoir. And uh, the writers that you will hear tonight, most of them have been with me uh, in these workshops for the last couple of years throughout the pandemic. And their writing has really blossomed. And you will hear, if you were here la last year for the festival and this year, you will see how much deeper and they've gotten to excavate their stories. And it's just, um, really, really satisfying and you will hear. Um, we're global tonight. Um, we have uh, Noah Kawaguchi who's going to be reading from Japan and uh, we have Kazumiro Tolentino who is come, coming live from Hawaii. And we have uh, two people who are on video who aren't able to join us on the live stream tonight. And um, I just wanted to mention that um, these workshops were free to um, all, the, all the participants and only they could contribute whatever they wanted to support APIC. And I highly recommend that you support APIC in any way you can so we can continue these kinds of programs and develop the talent that's within our API communities. Um, every week I throw out a prompt to the group and these prompts are designed to dig deep um, into the underlying layers of the subconscious, into the stories of, uh, that are buried somewhere in the memory fog. And uh, we try to approach it from different angles to surprise um, the, yourself so that you can kind of like get into that zone. And um, I find sometimes quotes I find sometimes photographs from art exhibits, a whole gamut of things to stimulate the imagination. And uh, we could talk about it at the end in the Q&A. But the first reader who will be on video is a longtime activist in the API community, a really respected artist and a leader in her community. Susan Hayase, she's in San Jose. She's a longtime activists in the San Jose Japanese American community. She stayed and um, she, she played taiko from 1980 until 1990 with San Jose taiko and was involved in the grassroots movement for redress and reparations. She's a co-founder of San Jose Nikkei Resisters, a multi-generational community organization in the San Jose Japan town. Susan Hayase.
There's no sound. Hold on one second, we're gonna replay. <laughs> This is a poem I wrote for a friend of mine who recently passed away. Losing you, Yamaguma, mountain bear. It's not just old photos of Sansei with thick, bushy, hippie hair in the long 60s, playing taiko in the parking lot in San Jose on drums that had evolved from barrels. It's not just raggedy bell bottoms on young bodies, half bold and half bent, raucous laughter masking an apologetic smile, too new to be knowing, yet full of wisdom's future, aspirations painted boldly across sharp exhalations and a sharp ki. It's not just all of that. He's there too, right there in the frame, but also in my mind's eye. Gitch, yes. Steve, yes. Yamaguma, mountain bear. But I always think of him as a lion, a man of his time, raised up by a gardener and in carcery, learning thoughtfulness from plants, watered by rain and sleet and music, biding his time raking and sweeping a path out of no path. You there, you see only the undifferentiated masses, generations like sheaves of rice, when really there are some golden grains growing there, like gitch, off beat, off the beaten path, syncopated beat like this, don, stone, don, stone. Don, 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 as if we could be fine with you gone. I wrote this next poem about unresolved um, issues. It's entitled, Do Crows Mourn the Dead? Rock is fun, beaks are clacking, trills, improvisation, feathers fly, beady eye, no commiseration. Rain like shards of glass, unending time, ages pass. Time for sun to kiss the earth, the crow waits unblinking. The erstwhile comrade lightly lies upon the leaves unbroken, wings as if in flight repose, open beak in caw or croak, gently jibe as if he's asking, but the grievance stays unspoken. Jitters, glumness, pinions rustle, Shrouded figures circling, somber aspirants in contemplation, and black as night, a lamentation. Who among them grieves the worst, and who is unaffected? We don't know yet the story's end, whose claws or dirge will be deflected. Thank you. Our next reader will be Lin Huang. Lin is a dancer, aspiring writer, and gyrotonic trainer. Originally from New York City, she currently dances with Lenora Lee Dance and is also a 2023 Proud Asian Improv Arts Fellow. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm going to be reading three poems or three works today. The first is a Sestina poem. Um, Sestina. Do you see the wound? Rended edges laced with light, peeking through your thin skin. 
We hold hands, wait, watch, listen. In silence, I listen for what the wound is holding. It hands me a whispered word, light like your top layer of skin, transparent, see-through. What have you gone through? I keep asking, keep listening, tracing the terrain of your skin with my fingertips. Trace the wound as it tries to heal, filled with light that spills into my hands, out of my hands, off my nails, seeps through layers of shadows and light that illuminate the stage. You listen for your cue to enter. You're wound up, waiting. An itch begins on your skin, crawls through layers of dead skin. You pick at it with clean hands, knowing the wound will break again. You look through the window, listening, looking for dawn, for light. Where is the light? You look down at your broken skin. Recall that you can listen to the sound of your breath into cupped hands. Inhale four counts, exhale for eight through the storm that birthed this wound. Listen, listen, the sound of light breaks the wound, the mounded skin. I hold both your hands tight through and through. The next two works are kind of um, related to each other. So, um, one is more of a recollection of a memory, and the second poem is also a sestina, but it kind of um, speaks to the same feelings or thoughts around it. Um, I missed Qingming again because I'm not near my grandmother's tomb at Kensico Cemetery in upstate New York. But I opened a can of longevity brand sweetened condensed milk an almost offering and poured it into a glass mason jar, tipped the can so it was held suspended perfectly inside the rim of the jar so that its sweet contents could flow from tin to glass. I remember how you always had a globular jar of sweetened condensed milk. Must have been an old jam jar because there were oranges on the lid that you stashed in the far left corner of the middle shelf in the fridge how you would make oatmeal every morning for breakfast and lace it with swirls of longevity brand team no lie, as you called it, sweet milk. When you are young, grandmothers are always old. My grandmother with her light gray coiffed hair and her meticulous clothes was young once when it was wartime, when there must not have been sweet milk to enjoy with breakfast. I remember her telling me how she had to hide in the hills in the wilderness. On this Qingming, I only remember pieces of what she told me. In running away, she came across a Japanese soldier who in a moment of humanity let her go, spared her life and her body. It was the story I told myself out of the fragments I remembered. My mom remembers this story differently. My grandmother told her that she had just given birth to a boy who was either stillborn or died by the time she birthed the afterbirth. A Japanese soldier came in naked and would have raped her, but a translator interceded, showed him the basin of her blood from the afterbirth. And so he left her alone. She was saved by the timing of her fourth child's birth and also his death. Grandmother. The comfort women survivors are all called grandmothers now. Here we are excavating the silences of the oppressed, the violated, the disappeared. Here we are digging through cold tombs of silence that death seals onto lifeless lips. Here out of the dust of fragmented memory are the voices that emerge, the voices of grandmothers rising. Remembrance rising. An archaeology of silence, we uncover, excavate forgotten, buried stories, secrets that speak into our present time. What will you remember? The grandmothers remember, breaking years of silence, we thumb through time like pages to excavate memories, truths that speak out of turn 
into our dark histories. But this is her story, her stories. So many women remember violence, violation. She will speak until the day she dies, damning silence, emerging as the butterfly that excavates earth, darkness, shadow, in order to fly this time. There is only this time. We live in commingled past, present stories, woven out of shrouds, excavated out of hidden tombs dimly remembered, where the quiet is a deafening silence. Out of reverence for the dead, we will speak. A kaleidoscope of butterflies, wings thundering, speaking into this moment in time. No more crystallized silence, only the layers of testimonies of stories, like fallen leaves, holding remembrance in each vein, waiting to be excavated. Dig deeper through the dust, excavate the annals of the past in order to speak a better truth, a truer remembrance into this half of history of time. Let these voices rise out of the dead stories, emerging to battle embittered silence. We archaeologists all excavate shards of time past, speaking calcified stories into flesh again, broken silences remember. Thank you so much. And I'd love to introduce the next speaker, writer, Carol Chin Morales was born and raised in San Francisco's Chinatown. Carol came to writing late in life after retirement from teaching at City College of San Francisco. She is thrilled to belong to Jenny's writing group, grateful for the chance to explore, listen to writers with diverse voices and to discover her own. Um, hmm. Thanks so much, Lynn. Six years ago, I had the privilege of hearing Jenny Lim read her poetry. That was my first time at the Bernal Heights Library. My response was to go home and write a poem myself. And I shared it with Jenny, who was amazed and humble. And um, she mentioned that this was the first poem she had ever received to honor her. Last November, 2022, I also was privileged to hear Jenny read at the last Hoisan Poets um, reading at the De Young Museum, um, the Corette Auditorium. And again, I found myself going home and writing another poem as a tribute to Jenny. And that's what I'd like to share tonight she didn't know about it because I didn't tell her. <laughs> so here we go. Jenny reading. Her velvety voice penetrates the darkened room, thoroughly captivating us. All eyes are riveted upon the songstress on stage, spellbound by her melodious full-throated voice, summoning us to gather. The intimacy of her beckoning enchants us, leading us on a journey with our wholehearted consent, a captured audience, she our guide, she the speaker of truth. We have yearned for this day to sit before the poet to be lost in her deep, rounded tones, feel the rich textures of her song, the distinct rise and fall of her voice. We marvel at her rhythmic progression so deliberate, 
yet so soulful. This is her scat. This is her jazz beat. This is her nod to Ella. This is also the truth splayed open before our eyes. Stunned, we sit quietly engulfed in the moment. The poet intones the familiar words of the anthem. Our country tis of. Then she stops abruptly, quickening our hearts with a provocative question demanding, for whom, for whom? The bitter taste of injustice woven into our country's history must not be forgotten. Injustice still burns with caustic racism, violence, inequality. From the dangerous work on the transcontinental railroad where men wield heavy pickaxes carving the sides of mountains and were lowered in tiny baskets to plant dynamite sticks on the sides of steep cliffs to the backbreaking labor required of enslaved men, women and children picking cotton in cotton fields under the scorching sun so that their masters could thrive and enjoy comfortable lives. The brunt of injustice has fallen again and again on the aching shoulders of the powerless and the vulnerable, on the cheap labor and expendable bodies of the immigrant and the enslaved. The poet bears witness poignantly but emerging from the long shadows of that blighted history, the poet sings out boldly with affirmation and hope. We are better than this. We are better than this, she croons. The poet has ignited a renewed vision in me to help one another rise together, climbing the steep stairway to our dreams together a better future is within, within reach if some of us would light the way, stand up for justice, live in kindness, actively build community, use our voices to provoke and inspire one by one, just as the poet has done for us today. The torch has been passed now, it is in our hands. Grasp it, feel the strength of the generations before us. At last, the poet is able to complete the first line of the anthem. She sings out with conviction the words, my country tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Yes, we affirm, sweet land of liberty, sweet land of equality, sweet land of belonging, sweet land of peace sweet land of justice, sweet land where we, you and me, are building that table extending to all people. And one day, may we be able to sit down together at that table in gratitude and love, knowing we have done our best Sweet land of liberty, sweet land of liberty. The stage is shimmering with hope, drenching the poet in light.
Thank you so much. Now as the Otis writer in the group, I believe, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the youngest writer. This is Noah Kawaguchi, who is at this moment speaking to us from Japan. Noah is a musician and writer from Ohio. He plays the shakuhachi and often creates work that reflects his perspective as a mix Shin Nisei Japanese American from the Midwest. Thank you so much, Carol. All right. So today I've got some got some short poems to read. Um, so first, first off, this is the four elements. Fire is that fickle devotion, filling my belly or flying around in the sky. It's almost unrecognizable after all the years lost, but will it still remember me? Water is that flowing glass, that looking glass around my ankles where the child still lives. But today the glass is thick and polluted as I try to make out that old photograph. Earth is that topsy-turvy hug, each hill and valley familiar in its novelty. I wish I knew where all the hills were hiding because I must, I must have forgotten to hug them back. Air is that wiggly juice, bearing me the meaning of life ever so carefully from wise vocal cords to tender eardrums. Every day I ask if it's tried wiggling through time. All right, next is called Art Official Intelligence. The music says nothing and stands up. I sit down and write music. The music walks around the room and climbs out the window. I think about standing up, but write music. The music rings my doorbell. I write down which note it was. The music slides a piece of paper under my door. I wonder if it's a poem. All right, next is taking directions literally during a winter storm. Her mighty fingers wrap around my skull but grasp only my own two hands already clenched against my scalp, lathering until the loop is over, scribbling icy corkscrews through my hair until every strand cascades into itself, thriving on my immobility. And when she loosens her grip, I remain the same, always in control of every moment I watch flow by and dance without me in the snow. All right, next is the chambers of my heart. My heart is a party, bass thumping in my chest at 60 beats per minute as cathartic choruses crest into fleeting eternities. Everyone I've ever known, carefree for the foreseeable moment, flowing through my bloodstream, touring my cardiovascular system, getting acquainted. My heart is a party. Each chamber offers a fresh array of aromas, never boring anyone. The first chamber smells like sriracha-flavored bubble tea, deep fried last week and guzzled with breakneck conviction while rounding the corner of a 50-foot racetrack. The second chamber at first smells like furniture polish, but after you introduce yourself, take a walk, and make a trip to the bathroom, it smells more like those cryptic roses that manage to remain pungent even when they don't have any water. The third chamber smells like California rolls, but only when your mind wanders from the conversation at hand 
or when you converse too long with someone whose consciousness has already gone home. The fourth chamber smells like an undulating body, sending senseless, senseless angular noises reverberating into a stoic abyss, but only when no one is there to listen. My heart is a party. The night lives on and on and on and off and on and on. Because for now, my skin is too thick to let the morning in, and my rib cage is too tight to let the thumping out. But I know a new playlist will come on in a few months or so that will resound right through every layer of my bones. All right, and then last is the silence of sound. I sit deep in silence or deep in the music. It won't tell me which one it is today. Ring, ring, a call for me. I wonder who it is. Everything we do is music, they say. Music, formerly loved, cruelly hammered through me without a moment of silence to think. Some sounds, former music, had become everything until they were nothing at all, a void. Silence, found once again. Is this a fertile ground for learning to grow some music anew? All right, that's all I got. Um, so I'll be introducing the next reader. Um, uh, so Lisa Oyama enjoys gardening, uh, Japanese flower arranging, volunteering with various API organizations, and dancing when nobody is watching. She lives in the Bay Area with her with her husband and dog, but will always be a Gardena girl at heart. Sato. The place where I felt completely normal and average, not a model of anything, and certainly not a minority. G Town, Gardena to the uninitiated. Where my dad taught me to play basketball and jump rope in the backyard of the pink house on Raymond Ave. And our front lawn was always the spot for races, tetherball, tag. Simon says, and red light, green light. Where we turned into teenagers and played tennis and roller skated on the smooth concrete of South Park back in the day when the courts were new and we all wore dittos and rainbow pocket jeans. Where our club basketball team roster read Ageno, Endo, Jung, Mochizuki, Manuki, Oyama, Sialana, Shiota, Tabata, Watanabe, and it was unusual because there were two names that were not Japanese. Where bento was something you took to school, not something you ordered at a restaurant, and nobody crinkled their nose and said, what's that, when you pulled out a musubi for lunch? Where we knew what sushi was before it became trendy, ordered from Sakai Sushi by the box, always wrapped in white paper and tied with a red string. Happy to play Uncle Min, John Kem Pol for that last piece of Ebby. Where my mom had her yarn shop for 42 years, across the street from Motoyama Market and a few doors down from Sakuraya Manju, Yo's Fishing and Tackle, Dr. Yoshida's medical office, John Suduta's insurance, and the Living Word Bible Store where you can still go to the Buddhist church carnival to stand in line for buttered corn on the cob, Okinawa dango, udon, teriyaki, and of course, tamales topped with chili con carne. Where I go back to commemorate holidays, weddings, lives beginning, and lives lost. This place we called home. No explanation needed.
our Furusato. My next piece is called Dear Obachan. I wonder now what I meant to you, this distant little girl an ocean away, your granddaughter. I didn't know that I had your nose until we came to Japan on our honeymoon and my new husband noticed it right away while looking at the formal photo of you hanging over the doorway of the tatami room in Uncle Yoshiharu's house. I hear stories of you now told with admiration and some regret by my mother, your daughter, about how you managed to keep everybody fed during the war and how she had complained in her childish ignorance that what she really wanted to have was just white rice, not this mixture of grains and filler you had been serving and how she imagined the pain and helplessness you must have felt then. And when her little brother, about three years old, kept saying to you, Kaji no nai tokoro ni iko, kaji no nai tokoro ni iko, begging you to take him to a place where there was no fire as the bombs fell. And your family gathered their things into a cart and walked and walked and walked to take shelter with relatives where there was no guarantee there would be no fire since there seemed to be no logic to where the Americans dropped their bombs. I wonder how you felt when your daughter left for America to marry her high school sweetheart, Kiyoshi. He was a Kibe, one of those Japanese Americans who seemed more Japanese than American. I know that I lived with you for several months when I was about three years old. My mother's first trip back to Japan after being away for six years. She had left a young bride and returned to visit with two daughters. I arrived there chattering away in English, oblivious to the fact that nobody understood me, but I caught on eventually to this other language spoken around me and left for America speaking only Japanese. I'm glad I was able to speak to you then, Obachan, since my ability to speak Japanese deserted me not long after we left you and went back to California. I'm guessing that our relationship when I was in Japan was mostly me asking you for help or for food or to tell you I was too hot or to tell you I had yet another mosquito bite, or to ask you what that sound was as the semi sent out their call. Me, me, me. In the stifling humidity of a Fukuoka summer. The only photo I remember of us together is of you carrying me on your back. A blurry photo and blurry memories. Thank you for carrying me, Obachan. Okagasama de. Our next reader is Leon Sun. Leon Sun is a San Francisco based visual artist whose work was embedded in the social activism of the 1970s to the 1990s. He currently works mainly in silkscreen printing, inspired by the spirituality of Asian and indigenous cultures. Sun writes from his memories of growing up in Shanghai, Hong Kong, and as an immigrant in America. He is also trying his hand at poetry and enjoys writing haiku. Hi, thank you, Lisa. My piece is from a prompt um, based on a Marvin Gaye song, What's Going On? And we were asked to write something about current events with some personal perspectives. Um, injected in there. So this is a part two of a three-part piece. Lu Chen Li can't take it anymore. He was so happy when he first got this job. The pay was a pittance, but for a guy who didn't speak English and had no skills except working the land, he was grateful. Tending to mushrooms, he could do that. 
But since then, what began as teasing of his awkward ways soon turned into relentless daily harassment, mean racist harassment, and everyone jumped in on the game. The humiliation consumed him. Well, he can't take it anymore. He won't take it anymore. What he bought the other day is now in his hands. It felt good, a solid modern piece of equipment, so much better than the crude farming tools he's used to. He switched it from hand to hand, feeling its weight and wondering if it would work to use his left hand. He could barely curl his fingers on his right hand, his knuckles swollen from years of working in the cold and damp. Oh, but I'm right-handed, he thought to himself. For something like this, I better use my right hand. I can't afford to mess up. I can stand the pain. For practice, he pointed it at imaginary targets. He knew what he had to do. The decision has been made. And now that he's got the gun, there's no turning back. Yes, today's the day. It was early morning, still dark and cold under the coastal fog. The workday had just begun and no one felt like talking yet. Everyone was slowly waking up to the drudgery of another day's work. He walked deliberately to the first work shed. He had walked this way so many times before, but today it looked different. As he approached the first guy, he felt his body moving automatically as if it was not his. He saw his own hand go up and point the gun right at the man's heart. He felt vindicated as he saw the shock on the man's face. It was as if he recognized Lu Chen Li for the first time. In a split second, the look of terror turned to one of realization that he was gonna die for what he did and it was too late to say sorry. That look was what Lu Chen Li wanted to see. He pulled the trigger. After the first one, the others were easier. He saved the guy he hated most for the last, the boss man. That Kai Dai had accused him of damaging the forklift, which he did not. And on top of that, he wanted him to pay $100 for repairs. As Chen Li approached him, he hid his right hand and gun behind his back. With his left hand, he held out a wad of cash, a hundred bucks to be exact. The boss man snatched it with a sneer. Then Lu Chen Li shot him. After it was all done, he felt the calm settle around his shoulders. The pop of the gun, people's panicked voices, all sounded muffled as if in a dream. He walked steadily and deliberately to his car. He could feel everyone watching him. But this time, it was in shock, not in mockery not in contempt, but in fear. No one sniggered at him anymore. He opened the car door, got in slowly, and put his emptied gun next to him in the passenger seat. He felt he had done his duty. He saved face, not only for himself, but for his parents and all his ancestors in China who were offended when they insulted him here in America. And he he executed those traitor countrymen who joined the others in tormenting him. Who the fuck they think they are, he admitted, muttered, muttered to himself. Nothing but a bunch of country hicks like me. On the, next, on the seat next to the gun was the letter he had written to his wife the night before. My dear wife, I'm so sorry I brought you here to this country. But you must know that my promises were sincere. Who could have known that the beautiful country would turn out like this? We were both willing to work hard and swallow bitterness for a few years so our children could have a better future, so we can support our parents in their old age. Who knew we would be living here like slaves? The barbarian treats his dogs better than he treats us. So today, I did what I had to do. We have, been, we have always been poor and we're used to struggle, but we cannot live without face. Please forgive me. Use the money we saved for a ticket home. 
people say the mother, motherland is better now. Even people like us can become rich. At least we will live with respect among our own kind. And maybe you will find someone who would be a better husband than me. Remember me to the children, your honorable and faithful husband, Chen Li. He sat in the car for a long minute while random thoughts entered his mind. He remembered the first time he inserted the key into the ignition, how proud he was of this, his first car. A red one too, for good luck. His uncle had sold it to him for cheap, but his wife hated the lingering smell of cigarette smoke inside. And he worried about making all the payments to his uncle. Ah, oh, but none of that matters now. They all seem like distant memories from another life. Nothing matters anymore. Thank you. Our next reader is Casimiro Utalentino. He is a retired judge and practice as a civil rights attorney. He has taught Asian American Pacific Islander history classes and enjoys reading, photography, and continuing writing about AAPI history and issues. Kaz. Thank you, Leon. This first piece that I'm going to re write, read is uh, a reflection on Chia Opata's images of before and after the bombing of Hiroshima. The images were called Devastation and Harmony. Uh, this piece I'm calling City of Seven Rivers. <clears throat> Day before, homes filled with people, with children, with animals, with birds and bees, sounds of war, flashes of anti-aircraft above the land, but far away. Boats and barges along the river and swimming children on the banks. Young people, old people, middle-aged people and babies, playing, sleeping, resting, chatting, working, eating and laughing living desperate lives, normal lives, quiet lives, funny lives, and happy lives. The city of Seven Rivers was alive and thriving. Night came. A roaring train on invisible flashing light tracks, pulsating, blasting away the wind and ether. Flashing lights, deafening noises, never ending thunder, windswept dust and ashes. <clears throat> no one came, no one moved, no sound, an empty world, no one, nothing. Many and most became one with the air, the dust, the wind, and the ether, or just melted into the earth. The city of seven rivers was no more. They came. A pinprick of light trying to shine through the darkness that was day. No people, no animals, no birds, no bees, no houses, no buildings, no churches, no bells, no cars, no trolleys, no river barges, gone in one fleeting blast of light and thunder. <clears throat> lives shattered in one flashing, fleeting moment. Lives shattered for hours, days, weeks, years, and decades. A day for dying, for living, or just in between. The city of Seven Rivers was no more. Night, day came again. Only darkness amidst the shuffling moans and cries of the dying remains. Faces are gone, hair is gone, clothes are gone, everything gone, melted into the earth, nothing. Only two souls remain, neither moving, just surviving, and living. Another pin of light pierces the air, the dust and the ether, casting a shadow on the two souls. The city of seven rivers was no more. Night and day came again. The night and darkness when the world was were, were no more, the end had come in the blink of an eye. The two souls did not know if they were alive or dreaming. No one could tell them their state of being. Ghosts of family and friends flickered in their minds. Silent screams and moans of the dying or dead were filled with solitude. Just the stillness and darkness permeated the world, their world. Continuing waves of death and dying abound. No moon, no sun, no stars to guide them. 
just a pinprick of light piercing the dust, the air, the ether. Only two souls sit quietly, waiting to live or die or in between for the coming days and nights. The city of seven rivers is no more. The second piece is a reflection on um, the Monterey Park shootings. It was very personal to me because I grew up next door in the city of Montebello. I've entitled it, What's Going On? I woke to a flurry of calls and texts, sad, confusing, warning, needing to process. What's going on? What's going on? What the hell is going on? Why can't we get along? Why all these guns and shootings? Can we talk about it and do something? Not a good time to talk? When is there a good time? After mass shootings? After more of our elders are attacked? After more police shootings? What's going on? Blue Trump's black, blue Trump's brown, blue Trump's yellow, blue Trump's all. Any safe places? From guns and fear? From anti-Asian violence? From the yellow peril? From the Ching Chong Chinaman to jab to flip? From mental health stigmas? From immigration hate? Any safe places? From mass shootings and killings? from school shootings, from police killing grounds, from band studio shootings, from police gangs. Any safe places to be free from racism, fear, hate, and prejudice. To be free from being bullied, pressured, and condemned. To be freed from the stigma of being a foreigner or having an accent. To be free to learn about your history and experience. To be free to have fun and to dance. When is there a good time to talk about gun control, to talk anti-Asian hate violence, to talk about mental health for people of color, to talk and act and change for our parents and kids, for our elders and friends, for immigrants and refugees, for farm workers and workers. When is there a good time for Black Lives Matter? Should we have started with Rodney King, with Vincent Chin, with George Floyd, now we have Tyre Nichols, all lynched, a full circle of violence and people of color. Black lives matter, Asian lives matter, truths matter, rights matter. When is there a good time to act and change? It's now where nothing matters and nobody is safe. I have a third quick piece, which I've entitled Ludovico, which is the name of my father. Where did my father go? You escaped death two times, guerrilla fighter for a nation that did not want you, the Batan death march, Papa's prisoner of war, survivor of both in service to an ungrateful nation, immigrant father to five, worked two jobs for over 25 years, survivor of both in service of a grateful family. Death came and now you are gone. You've spoken with an accent, they said, <clears throat> and ignored you. Your intellect was defined on how you spoke English. Decades of ignorance based on racism and prejudice created a gap between what you and you could have been. Your life was defined by your accent. Your life and two histories so mis misunderstood. Sandwiched by your service of honor, loyalty, loyalty, and layers of racism. Yet you fed, clothed, and educated five children. Change the world, you said. We are the evidence of proof of your sacrifice and survival. You remain with us in how we live our lives. We are your legacy. Thank you very much. Uh, next reader and speaker is Grace Morizawa. Grace is the education coordinator for the National Japanese American Historical Society writing and teaching about Japanese American incarceration during World War II. After decades of teaching and dabbling in writing, Jenny Lim's class opened the door to her voice to the increasing scene of Asian American stories. Grace? Thank you. Thank you, Kaz, and thank you for your beautiful uh, writings. Or powerful writings. And I'd also like to do a little shout out 
uh, appreciation to Jenny for having us in the class and all of the class because it's a wonderful experience to be writing with other Asian writers. So the name of my piece, it's a prose piece, is called Everything Seems Real. Suddenly, I was in a different place. My feet were on the ground, but there was no ground. I felt I was with nature, but saw no trees, no grass, or even the sun. This world was a whirl of colors, soft and still and yet not, yet not moving. I took a step through the groundless ground. Hikolchan, Hikolchan, at last we're together. My mother embraces me, her glasses askew as they always were. Your papa and I have been here knowing that someday we'll be together. Where's papa, I said, as if it was perfectly natural to talk to my mom who had died 50 years ago. Oh, he's wandering in the clouds, looking for inspiration to compose another lullaby for you. You knew I was coming? We've been watching your earthly being all this time. We are very proud of you, but you still can't cook. No worries, though. We don't eat. How come I can see you and don't see you? I know your glasses are falling off your nose and I can't see you. You hugged me and it felt so good, but I didn't feel your arms. It takes a little getting used to existence without existence, but you're here. I thought I saw you and Papa once 35 years ago. I was in the operating room, afraid of cancer, afraid of getting a transfusion of bad blood, afraid I would die under the harsh lights of the operating table. Then I saw two beams of light, like suns smiling down at me, saying, it's all right. You were smiling and nodding. It's hard to let you go, but your life was barely beginning. It would have been selfish to want you here with us. And my dad, Hiko-chan, you're Buddhist. Did you forget we are all one with no beginning or ending? I hear a quiet gong, then footsteps. My little girl, Papa lifts me in the air and puts me on his shoulders. With that lift, I got a glimpse of earth glowing green and saw my house, my nephews and nieces, and my dog, Millie. The scent of incense wafted through the air. Water splashed on me. Wake up, wake up, Auntie Grace. You need to clean your house. Wake up. And my little nephew pinched my nose. Ouch. Yeah. In the distance, I could hear my fa father's lullaby. Sweet girl, sweet girl, the apple of my eye. We'll see you when you wake in our beautiful world. Sweet girl. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce Leslie Yi Murata, writer, artist, healer, spiritual drummer, lover of learning the mysteries of inner and outer space. Leslie? Hi, thank you, Grace. I have uh, uh, several short poems. <clears throat> the first one is called Someone, someone once said, only three could keep a secret if two are dead. How many times have you shared a hope only to have it dashed? An opinion only to have it used against you? An idea only to have it stolen in a heartbeat? So keep it close to your heart. Bring it to fruition. Tend that seed of your imagination and harvest your creation. Uh, 
the next one. Don't judge me. Don't judge me for my silence. I feel your pain. Am I to be shamed to hate as fiercely as I love? What I allow inside my own bubble, that which is crazed with fine cracks. Who dares to bear their soul? Is it safe to share for all the world to see? Dare I cross the line if you show me yours and I won't show you mine? It's time. She is ready as we planned when the pains came. It's time to fly away with the angels, she said. It's time. Stay a little bit longer, words pouring between my helpless fingers. It's time. 98 years, proud and fierce in her own terms. It's time. Oceans of tears for the lost years. All are forgiven. It's time. Obituary. Don't bother crying when I die. Love, hate me while we're alive. What will survive when truth and lies collide? Okay. Thank you. That's the end. Thank you all uh, for uh, joining us in this celebration of diverse API voices. Uh, Melanie, you want to um, go into the Let's give everybody a hand. Shout out. That was so awesome and so beautiful. So proud of you all. Uh, Melanie, are you there? Wait, yep, I'm uh, here. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Thanks. everyone. Thank you so much for all of your readings, for your offerings. I, I really enjoyed listening to each of you. Um, and it's just, yeah, just a testament to Jenny's work and and the community she's created with all of you. Um, and I always enjoy coming to the to these readings and getting to hear what, what folks have been working on. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna transition into the Q&A portion. We have some audience members here on, on Zoom as well as on YouTube. If you have um, questions you wanna ask any of the artists or Jenny um, on Zoom, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, for those of you on YouTube, you can type your questions in the chat and we'll make sure to, to ask them in the room. So anyone here on Zoom have any comments or questions that they wanna ask? On YouTube, Charlene Boomer Ignacio said, I miss you all. Oh, oh Boomer. We miss <laughs> you. We thought you were gonna be part of this. <laughs> but she's traveling. She's a traveling woman. Yeah. Charlene was in the last series, right? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Anyone else here have questions for the readers tonight or comments that they want to relay? Feel free to unmute yourself. I just wanted to thank everybody who, who read tonight. Um, it's it's been a uh, for me being being uh, growing up not not appreciating as much of uh, my my culture. Um, I've I've really uh, wanted to explore it more recently, and just to hear this range of perspective, um, it's very eye opening. I was just telling my wife that I cried. I was I was just crying. I was like, I this is so um, beautiful and and just. Uh, it gives me so much, uh, just more dimension and, 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 and pride 
and and seeing all this um all 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 this beauty just written in this written form and from all these voices so so thank you all very much it it, it means a lot come join us angelo we'd love to have you <laughs> i'll take that i i will i'll email you after this um kind of jumping off of that i guess a question i can to anyone who wants to answer yeah um there's not a lot, I, there are spaces for Asian Americans to come together and, and talk about their writing and write together, but you know, it, it, we don't see it that often, especially in, in spaces that don't have a large Asian or Asian American population. So for all of you, what was, um, that participated this time, what was it like to be able to come together in community like this and share your stories and um, as Asian Americans, I just, yeah, anyone who wants to answer that question, go ahead. This is Cass. Uh, I think growing up, I've always wanted also helping to teach a Filipino American class. I've, all, I've always wanted to tell the stories, but instead I became a lawyer. And uh, those stories stayed in the back of your mind until I retired and had had all this in the back of my mind that I needed to uh, to let go, I suppose. And I wanted to make sure the stories are accurate. I mean, you see, you hear them all the time, but they're distorted or they add, uh, you know, false facts to uh, to my experiences. And uh, so I wanted to make sure we had an accurate representation. And this is my first writing workshop. I have never really written in these various uh, forms. Uh, I, I really appreciate the prompts because from a, I, they have weird names like Chenga, Villanelle, uh, Haiku I've heard of, but um, I tried all of them just to, uh, and tried to reflect my own cultural background and, and doing so. Um, so it was a real challenge, but it was, uh, it was a good experience. Thanks, Casimiro. Grace, go ahead, share, share, tell us about what your experience was like. Oh, unmute unmute unmute. yourself, please. <laughs> Grace, thing. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking today and then after listening to Angelo, like um, what I really, really appreciate um, today was a lot of the strong emotion. And I know like when you get together with um, activations, we are always talking kind of politically, uh, talking about culture and but there's something different when people write about it you know or write a poem or write a story these um, emotions come out and um they're right there and i i really love that this class is a safe place to kind of share our emotional being and um i feel i felt really like very cathartic today listening to people talk about things because the world to me right now is very very chaotic so and then Jenny gives us these really hard hard prompts sometimes I just can't write to them and sometimes when I hear other people writing to them I feel like oh I can do that so I'm I have to catch up yeah it's great I like it thank you Grace Anyone else? Yeah, this, is, this has been a real support group for me, artistically and personally. Um, you know, at this age, I'm still going through a process of self-discovery through writing. And it couldn't have happened without this group and with Jenny's leadership. You know, she's not only a, a writing teacher, but a spiritual leader as well. You know, I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Leon. Just a quick update from um, you. You called her Boomer, or I'm, I'm assuming Charlene. I don't know. Yeah. Her. She says she's deep in her move. Last day of the house is tomorrow for the walkthrough. Thank you all for the medicine. Yay, Charlene. Good luck with the move. <laughs> we love you. We miss you. Um, you found her too. She found her van that she's going to convert to her home. Ooh, van life. 
Anyone else wanted to talk a little bit about what their experience was like meeting and, and writing together? Go ahead, Leslie. It was, uh, it's, it's, uh, was a wonderful place to uh, let my inner child uh, run loose again. Um, so uh, as, as a child, I, I did write, I think in middle school, but then my, my comic strip got lost. And then uh, during college, some eleven moves or something. <laughs> and then, then when I took it, a class with Charlie Chan, Chan uh, when I was thirty, I I had stage fright. I mean, I'm loud, but uh, in front of people, I I couldn't read my stories. But when I came here, I I could do it and uh, really feel safe and comfortable, and um, it's really helped me. Uh, just let it all come out so i'm trying different medias of doing it too so having fun with it thank you so much everybody for supporting all of us together and it's, it's it, it helped me through these the four lost years i call those like the worst years and <laughs> so everything's getting better now so the wave of the good stuff's coming back now so thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. Yes, let's all let our inner children be free and um, and find safe spaces, more safe spaces like this to create. Hi, May, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like again to um, say to my fellow classmates, it's been three years actually, I think November when I was fortunate enough to be <laughs> to be chosen to, to be in uh, Jenny's class, November, 2020. Um, every time I hear your writing, either in poetic form or posts or, or posts or stories or essays, memoirs, um, every word stimulates my brain and warms my heart and at times stab at my nerves. So I really cannot say enough how much I, how much my, my being has grown, myself has grown from, from hearing, from hearing what, you know, from your sharing and, and also, you know, my attempts of doing some writing myself. And I really want to thank Jenny, our fearless loving, understanding, uh, facilitator, instructor, advisor, and all of you, you know, I learned so much from each of you, not only in terms of how to write, but also hearing about, you know, learning about life, different, uh, your life stories, your, uh, it just, I, I just can't say enough. I, I just, I feel so, um, so what? Uh, so, but I, I guess I can't think of the word. But I just want to thank you. Uh, all your all the sharing tonight was just beautiful. No matter how many times I've heard it, Lynn, you know, heard your <laughs> your pieces before, you know. Oh, it's just it's just so beautiful. And of course, Leon, you know, and uh, Cass also. Yeah, I I don't get tired of hearing it again and again. It's it's just 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 earth shattering and um, really warms my heart. Thank you. Thank you, May. That was lovely. Um, and, and thank you for giving appreciations to everybody. I can tell that you, yeah, you really bonded with folks and, and this class has meant a lot to you and I'm sure to the others as well. Um, I, yeah, so I also want to ask Jenny a question. <laughs> Jenny said this is your fourth series um, and you've been yeah gathering these folks together, challenging them, I'm, I'm hearing with some hard questions. Um, yeah, what was it like to do the fourth one? What was your goal, like, for you, like, what were you trying to pull out of folks? And what was your goal this time in terms of, like, the workshop? You know, uh, I, I'm learning all the time. And each time I learn more. And um, I feel like what I do is I open the door and let them walk through. And, um, you know, and I tell them, don't worry, 
you're good. You're good to go. Whatever you have to say, say it. You know, uh, I throw you the prompts. You make your own rules about how you want to respond to it. And um, I guess uh, that was also my uh, style of uh, parenting. And um, I guess that's why my daughter is like so anal because <laughs> I, I gave her so much. I gave them so much freedom, you know, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I says, just, just do it. And um, I think everyone has a unique uh, talent and genius. And the problem in our API community is that we've experienced so much trauma and suppression that our voices got buried and, um, and we see that happening, you know, and that's why it's so important that we have our community, our safety um, in this writing group because our voices always get drowned out, you know, whether it's in the academia and political spheres, you know, social spheres, we tend to get drowned out or um, invisibilized. And in this group, everyone, is acknowledged, everyone's presence is felt and honored and respected. So for me, it's about allowing the container to find its own identity as a community. And that's the most important thing. You can't impose, this is what the community is about. This is what writing is about. Um, it's a collective creative experience. and. So the credit goes to each of the individuals in the group for finding where to connect with each other. And I would say, I could honestly say, I would trust anyone in this group of my life if it came down to it. That's the depth of my respect and trust even more than people in my own family, you know, in some respects, in certain ways, because, you know, when you write, you're really bearing your soul, your, you know, and the, we don't even talk about confidentiality anymore. And that was like in the first syllabus, you know, um, we know that we trust each other and, um, and we don't find that outside, you know, of, of these circles of uh, sacred circles of community, because, um, you know, like you were saying, it's violent out there. I just read that uh, three out of four Asian Americans in the last year through a research study done in Colombia have experienced some degree of racism, harassment or violence. That that's pretty severe. Three, you know, three out of four. So that's why trust and safety, security is so important. And and you know, when you feel that fear, you really can't speak out freely. And these stories don't come out if there's fear. We have um, so that's what we're here for to, you know, say it's okay. You can say it. Yeah, you need to say it to save your own life. So Thanks, Jenny. Um, I love everybody, yeah. <laughs> Amazing, um, yeah, it's just so beautiful. And yeah, Jenny's, you know, creating these families, like we're basically, like how you said, you're treating them like your kids, like <laughs> <laughs> um, gathering everyone together, creating our own, you know, chosen families and in creativity and writing. Um, it's really is just beautiful. And like you said, I, I totally agree. I was just having that conversation with actually Angela yesterday about how sometimes like, you know, we tell ourselves, oh, no one wants to listen to us. And, you know, like my, my opinion is not important, but to have spaces where people build you up and, and tell you that what you have to say is important and, and you should really do, you should use your voice. Um, to say whatever it is that you want to say that's um yeah just you know to have spaces like this to be able to to practice that and and be able to build upon that it's always yeah amazing <laughs> we need to keep doing more <laughs> for sure in the future and um i'm i'm looking forward to seeing you all grow as writers and 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 as poets and uh, whatever mediums you because uh, i know some of you are other visual artists dancers whatnot <laughs> as well so um 
glad to see that you're expressing yourselves in different ways here. And it wouldn't uh, have been possible without APIC support. Oh, so yes. a giant shout out to you and Benet and the whole crew. Yes, always, always um, lovely to work with Jenny. Always want to support her work. And, and yeah, it's important to us. So <laughs> um, I think we have a couple more minutes. If anyone has any last minute remarks or reflections they want to bring up, or if there's anyone on YouTube that has questions. Speak now. <laughs> Otherwise, um, Jenny, are you like, are you going to be continuing these workshops? Is there um, more signups? I think we we in the have future? A, um, a couple of spots open because some people had to leave this last mm -hmm. um, time. So if, if want anyone really wants to join in, um, let let me or APIC know. I also want to um, let everyone know that we, there's another upcoming re reading. Yes, yes. That's going to be part of the festival on May 6th at four o'clock. And that's uh, Saturday, I believe. And that's a whole different group of API yes. writers. And Tiffany is there and she's part of that group. Nice. And Angela, I don't see her on this Zoom, but she's um, they're listening in and they're going to be reading their writing on May yes, 6th. Um, so, yeah. Your diaspora writers group, correct? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So May 6th, I think it's at 4 p.m. also online. Um, if you haven't um, checked it out, you can you can look it up um, on apiculturalcenter.org. Um, you can sign up for that event. Um, there's also all the other events that we have for the festival um, from now until June. So there's like a, we have, I think, 23 total events and they're all AAPI focused, um, all different mediums. So I really encourage you all to go check that out and, and join us, join join us for next week for Jenny's reading and join us for some of the other events that are happening as well. Thank you, Melanie. You're Thank welcome. Thank you, Angela <laughs> and TJ. Thanks everybody. And that is the end of today's That was program. so beautiful. And Carol, you <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> My gosh. All Your right. delivery was so beautiful. All of you. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. 